This is The Weekly Set, the official podcast of thetotalscreen.com. Episode 200, recorded March 29th, 2019. Hello, everybody, and welcome to The Weekly Set, the official podcast of The Total Screen. I am your host, my name is Tyson, and joining me today, as always, is my partner in crime here at The Total Screen, William Rorick. Hello. And today, since it is our 200th episode, we are joined once again by our good friend of the show, Nick. Hello, hello. And since it is our 200th episode, as I had mentioned before, we are going to be playing a round of Advocates of Great Television. Anybody who doesn't know what that means, it just means that we each pick a show to discuss us and we all watch those shows and we're going to kind of be an advocate for the show. So Nick picked the show, he's going to be an advocate for his show and talk about why he likes it and, and why it's important to him. And then we're all going to kind of just discuss that episode. Then we'll hand it over and Will will bring up his show and why he picked his show. And we'll, we'll, we'll discuss that and then I'll do my show and we'll discuss that. And then after we play advocates, we're going to have a little brief trivia game that we're going to play and uh, that's going to be pretty much it for the show. Just our usual format stuff after that. Anybody tuning in for The Magicians, knowing that there was a episode this week, we're not going to be discussing that this week. We will discuss that next week as well as the next week's episode. So we'll discuss both of those episodes next week. But today we're, we're focusing on advocates and we're focusing on the shows that we each picked. Advocates of Great Television so the first pick up is Nick. Tell us about your pick. Yes. So the show that I picked was The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel, which of course is on one of Amazon's original shows, and, and specifically the pilot episode. And the reason why I chose this is because, well, it, it's actually a recent show that, uh, that I started watching. Uh, my fiance and I actually, we would, we've been just watching it from beginning to end. Once the, once we watched the pilot, we were of course enamored with it. And for me, the show, I think, just it catches you right away from just the the way the characters interact, and you get the music, and you get the settings, and then of course just the banter between all the characters. It it really comes alive, I think, and the progression of the episode, I think, shows a very good interpretation of how to do a pilot correctly. It gives you just enough to really get the show going, but it leaves you with just enough questions to kind of make you go, okay, I, I want to see more. I want to see, I want to really dive more into this. And yeah, I guess when I think about the different characters, you know, for example, uh, Midge Maisel and just how her character is, it, it, she's this, you know, housewife and has the perfect life. And then of course, uh, a bad turn of events happens and now she's really has to rethink her life and how she does things. And everything kind of just falls apart for her. <laughs> exactly. You know, again, yeah, she has to really make some changes in her life. So, so before we get full into the discussion, I should point out that this show is created, uh, it's show run and this episode was directed by Amy Sherman Palladino, who is the creator of Gilmore Girls. And this is kind of like her, her big follow-up to Gilmore Girls. So these are like, you know, the two shows she's going to be known for as the ages go by, is uh, Marvelous Miss uh, Maisel and Gilmore Girls. But yeah, uh, Will, what did you think? I, I'd seen this episode before, before before I hand it over to you. I had seen this episode twice, actually, before. <laughs> Once, like, because this was part of Amazon's pilot season, where they would release, like, a pilot before they committed right. to the whole show. Right, which they That's don't do that it. anymore, as far as I Yeah, know. they don't do that anymore, but they, they used to do that with a few shows, and so I watched it way back in the pilot season time, but by the time it actually hit Amazon, it was just, like, I, I'm not a fan of, like, Amazon's, like, app and stuff, and I didn't have, like, a, a Roku at the time. I had, like, a Chromecast, and they didn't support that, and I've talked on this podcast before about how Amazon pisses me off with that stuff, but <laughs> anyways, like, it was just kind of a pain to actually just sit down and watch it, like, to be able to, and then I recently got a Roku and mainly to, to watch some stuff on Amazon because there's it's been building up stuff and there's there's lots more good stuff coming to it that I'm like I want to watch this damn it <laughs> <laughs> so so I finally just bit the bullet got a Roku hooked it up and Marvelous Miss Maisel is like the or Maisel is the first thing I really jumped into I think 
Because I'm like, okay, I, I finally, I just want to watch more of this. There's already two seasons out. It's been like years mm-hmm. since I've seen the pilot. So I'm just going to start over and watch it. And I grab my mom because I'm like, she's going to like this too. So I'm like, here, watch this with me. We've been to watch the show with me. And she's like, okay. And, and we both loved it. It's great. Um, and it's really entertaining. And, and I'm happy I was able to uh, jump back into it. But so now I want to ask Will, what did you oh. think? Because you'd heard me talk about the show before, but you hadn't I, ever I, seen it. Yeah, I hadn't ever seen it. Uh, to be fair, I don't really watch much Amazon Prime stuff. Uh, it's probably my, my least watched platform. <laughs> uh, you should have a really deep breakdown of the episode now that you've seen it so many times, Tyson. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he probably has more of a breakdown on it than I do. <laughs> <laughs> I did I did make a, a few notes of things I wanted to bring up about the show. Better than what I did. <laughs> but, but can, I, can I say that I absolutely love Tony Shalhoub and he like, yes. spills the seeds in every scene he's in. That's <laughs> <laughs> That's the thing. I think I came to that realization again, not even necessarily with the pilot, but when I was like, I don't know, halfway through season one or something, I'm like, you know what? Like, you always hear people like in the UK or something, and they'll talk about like Stephen Fry and say, oh, Stephen Fry is a national treasure. And you never really hear that about like, you know, American performers or something. But I'll say this right out. Tony Shalhoub is a national treasure. Amen. I can see that. <laughs> and I have never even seen Monk, and I, I've heard really good things about it, but I know that was one of the shows that really kind of got him well, even made him even more popular among different people. And then right. now with Mrs. Maisel, it's, he really is a good fit for the part, I think. Yeah. And He's, I think his, his mannerisms and the way how he interacts with different people, let alone his wife or his own daughter for that matter, it, it's very, Almost, you can definitely tell he's a he's a man of academics. Yes, he's he's definitely a smart man. And and, and you picked the pilot episode, and I think that that's the right choice, just because it gives you kind of an overview of everything oh, that the show well, is. Well, the pilot episode sets up the premise. Right? Yeah. So, yes. So so basically, it sets up everything that happens in the series that the series is founded upon, because mm-hmm. you get to see the event, you get to see how she was before her inevitable turn as a comedian. Which is what you get to see in future episodes. So, this episode here, you see her as a devoted housewife. She's completely devoted to her husband, who totally doesn't deserve her, by the way. The guy's an asshole. Uh, <laughs> it's pretty obvious he's an asshole. He's, he's just like... I'm Oddly gonna... enough, I think as the series goes on, you actually get to like like him a little bit. Really? Well, not this yeah. you don't. You never love him in the same way you do like the rest of her family and stuff. Right. But like, you do kind of get you, you get a little sympathy for him and a little bit more understanding of, of because, who he because, is. Because he's like focused on like making this comedy career but he's not really putting effort into it like he's not writing his own material he's just stealing from from famous comedians and he's like, oh everybody <laughs> steals and it's like and and then he blows up on her saying you know like that was his dream to make it big and it's like well all you did was was force your wife to get you slots at clubs and and then repeat like stolen material like what do you like like when she when she like defends herself you know when he's leaving her and she's like telling him to his face all this stuff I'm, I'm just like yeah right on like you are 100 percent correct and, and he's just blaming her and being an asshole so mm-hmm. yeah so, as it goes on i think you, you the one thing that makes him more sympathetic is you begin to understand that he's he's untalented right and that that's the key is that he's somebody who loves comedy but doesn't have the talent for it right right and so for him you know it's like he it's something he can't excel in but he really desperately wants to and so there's like a jealousy there in seeing like when other people are able to succeed or or in, in you know like the way he over you know over credits himself for any kind of victory he gets in that area or something mm-hmm. but it's because he's untalented and it and it's you can see a little bit of it in the pilot in general where he, he realizes his wife is funnier than he is but it, it becomes much more apparent as the show goes on to him and that becomes like a bigger part of his character mm-hmm. and, and, and also his acceptance of that event there's also a tragedy mm-hmm. there's also a tragedy in that for her where where she set this up like this is her perfect life right she in the beginning it shows her wedding her wedding toast right and she's going on and on about how she planned everything that happened in her life to 
to like the letter, you know, and how it's like she she played like this this man was the perfect man, and so when we see her in her married life, you know, she she is acting like that she is perfectly where she needs to be. This is what she planned, and then when mm-hmm. it all falls apart, it's even more tragic because because she is completely lost at that point. We say tragic, but in the end, it kind of ends up like well, it's it, the making of the whole series. It's like yeah, the best yeah, thing it, that could happen. It's not actually way. tragic, because, <laughs> but, but to her, it, it, it's tragic. In the moment, that, it is. <laughs> it, it's tragic in the sense that she she set things up like that without thinking of other possibilities, or or like she she led herself to believe she was living the perfect life, and when maybe she wasn't. In fact, I yeah. think one I think one thing you can bring up with that, you know, with the the fact that she's the more talented comedian as it were compared right. to her husband what's interesting is that you know you know that that she's the comedian from the very first scene when she's making the toast you you immediately yeah. know it even if you don't know anything about the show you watch it you know that hey she's making a speech she's telling a little bit of jokes and whatnot she's basically doing stand up as her time right exactly well she's literally standing up making the toast yeah. <laughs> but anyway to go with that Will, you were talking about the her perfect life, and when she's during her toast and she's explaining all these different things. For example, she was mentioning how oh that she and Joel would go to these poetry dramas, and then reality they're actually going to cabarets and and watching other stand ups. And one thing I was thinking was already she's already telling a lie to everyone, and then maybe it's foreshadowing that maybe her life is a lie that she's actually uh, living a lie. Right, right. Sure he's the living lie, but the person that she's with is living a lie. And then of course we find out later on that it's exactly what happened. So I think it definitely there's definitely some foreshadowing and some symbolic uh, realms with that. I love the way a lot of the stuff that's like perfectly funny and fine on its own in the pilot ends up like later on as you watch the series. Sorry, Will, <laughs> it's talking about stuff you haven't seen, but like plays into like 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 it gives more context to it later in the series. Like mm-hmm. there's the whole scene with Midge's like morning routine. How yes. she like makes herself like puts on all the stuff when he's already a sleep all her like beauty care products and then takes it off and puts on her makeup and everything just to get in bed in time for when he wakes up so that she can be perfect for him and you're kind of like wow like you know like it goes with the narrative of the pilot of of how much she does to make the marriage work and everything and how much she puts into that but there's like a deeper meaning to it later on when you see that her mom does the exact same thing and this (laughs) is like this is like something she learned from her mom and like and her mom is so obsessed with like appearances i I think all of her ideas are were learned from her mom. Yes, like, uh, m- many. Uh, uh, very much. I'm, uh, I'm sure would actually would have been also of the times as well. That's yes. exactly what you would oh, have done. Yeah, Same yeah. thing. And, and that's actually also in the culture because it's a very like upper class Jewish culture show. Right. Which which I really dig because I, I like it whenever a show like really brings in like a culture, especially if it's something I'm not necessarily fully aware of or like uh, that I'm that I'm deeply I- involved in. So it, it brings like it, it's like I'm learning a little bit about culture as well when I'm watching it. You know, and there mm-hmm. was a lot of Jewish culture throughout this episode. I mean, the number of times she's picking up black and white cookies, you know, <laughs> and, mm-hmm. and uh, just the occasional Yiddish that's brought throughout it, and, and it only gets more so as the show goes on. Like, uh, like I was, I was gonna say, like, I'm happy you picked the pilot episode because I think it's the right episode to start with the series. Obviously, mm-hmm. it's it's the intended order; it's the first episode, right? Exactly. But in general, but but like at the same time, I'm like, man, there's there's some episodes in like season two that are like so good. Like, yeah. When they go to that summer camp, oh. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's so good. And like, and, and a lot of the stuff that I end up really digging on the show is the stuff that's really heavily tied into that very specific upper class Jewish American culture. And I think that a lot of the kind of like the appearances is part of that. Like it's you know the oh Yom Kippur is tomorrow. We finally got the rabbi. We've been trying for five years. Like that aspect. It's mm-hmm. all kind of about like you know being the impressive one that you can bring up. Like oh we have the rabbi by over for Yom Kippur, you know, and it's like a bragging point or something that very like, like appearances are, are so strong. And, and you get in this, it, it's like played mostly for comedy and also is, is part into like showing how, how, uh, organized her life is and how much she's trying for that. But as the show goes on, you really also get the perception of, of like why it's like that for these individual people, like why these things are important to them. Mm-hmm. And, uh, it, it's, it's great. I, I love it when shows do that. <laughs> and, and the show in general is just, I think it's, I think it's one of the best shows on, whether it's on TV or on the internet, doesn't matter. I think it's one of the best new shows out there right now. It's definitely, and, and it's, it, it is, like, I, I definitely feel that way. And, and I also definitely, I'm glad that we have 
something to fill the gap that Mad Men left behind too. And but yeah. but it's not as painful to watch as Mad Men, which yeah. makes it better <laughs> in a way. I only made it up to the second end of the second season. Actually, I didn't even start after the third se- start the third season. I wanted to, but I never got around to it. So now that you brought that up, I'm going to have to dig into the rabbit hole of it's Mad Men again. It's a great show, but it's it can be depressing. <laughs> yeah, even this, even the, the those first two seasons, they were they were at times pretty difficult to watch. Yeah. Just yeah. Sometimes almost cringeworthy. You know, I think you... the thing I, I dig most about Mad Men, though, it, and what, why I brought it up in relation to this, though, is the way it looks at the past and all of its politically uncorrect glory. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and the way, the way it like shows these aspects of, of the past and, and kind of presents them, uh, the, the little bits of casual racism and sexism that are, that are sprinkled throughout, um, oh, yeah. Marvelous Miss Maisel, or, uh, Maisel, uh, and, um, in Mad Men, Men, you get a lot of that as well. I always c- cite like one of my favorite moments in Mad Men is like when they have a picnic, and at the end of the picnic, he just grabs the picnic blanket and flips it up, and all the food and trash just scatters down the hill, and they just leave. And that, <laughs> <laughs> like that was just an acceptable thing, you know, of that time, you know. And and uh, you get some of that here too in throughout this show. There's like little bits where it's like it's so weird when it happens, but then you're like, oh yeah, well that's the time, you know, that's like what was accepted in that time versus like now you know <laughs> i remember one thing they were talking about uh, in when when midge goes to the gaslight to deliver the brisket with her her pot and she makes a mention when she's looking for it how it's a pyrex and when you think about it pyrex was very much a sort of a de facto standard in in, in glassware that you could heat up really hot and it wouldn't break or anything like that and now pyrex is sort of gone off the deep end they're not as good as they used to be but back then they they were the they were the brand for yeah. glassware. Well, they were they were like synonymous with with, with glassware in general, and they, they mm-hmm. were like like the way Xerox. You know, I have to make right, a Xerox, Xerox or Kleenex. Yeah. You know, yeah, things like that. exactly. Or Nintendo. Or exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the way like a, a a brand becomes synonymous with the actual thing itself, yeah, and and the person is just completely doesn't understand it, and that's also related, I think, to the upper class angle of her character. Mm-hmm. That like Pyrex was like kind of an expensive thing for you know these these upper middle class like homemakers and stuff and and this comedy club is not in an upper middle class area right. so it's like they're of course they're not going to know what pyrex is they're not going to you know have any knowledge of that that's not going to be something that's part of their everyday life yeah because she doesn't even mention what it exactly is he just says oh it's pyrex and she's expecting the the, the other woman to know what that is yeah one thing I wanted to bring up about this show in general, because because I just really like it, is that they brought Lenny Bruce into the show. Um, mm-hmm. It makes me, it, it's so to the point that like every time like a character is introduced in the show, I'm like looking up to see if it's a real person. <laughs> because because Lenny Bruce was such a surprise. Because he was such a, you know, a hugely influential comedian. And he features pretty prominently in a few scenes in the pilot. But I mean, throughout the series, he's a big character in it as well. It's not like he only shows up the pilot he's like throughout the whole show and yeah i i really dug the way they were able to do that it's kind of historical fiction in a sense it's weird because i didn't i'll, I'll be honest i didn't i started to wonder if lenny bruce is actually real and then i just looked up right now and i'm going wait a second he actually is real yeah i, I, feel, oh, yeah. Really, I feel really stupid about that and i feel like i should know that and then lenny bruce reason, is like the, sure the guy that. that uh he's like the predecessor to george carlin so, right or, like yeah george carlin richard pryor you know those guys yeah yeah the politically incorrect comedian kind of you know he was like kind of the first or like the first really noteworthy one he's like the guy that started that it's actually like george carlin actually does one of lenny bruce's bits like he's changed it and made it his own but like you know if you've ever heard like george carlin do his thing about the the words you're not allowed to say on tv and that kind of Mm -hmm. stuff that came from lenny bruce like he was like the first one to do that and then george carlin kind of did that like in honor of him so if you watch like the really early george carlin performances when he does that he'll like cite lenny bruce when he does it i do recall that in the 60s when George Carlin was starting to make a name for himself, he was also like Lenny Bruce, short hair, clean shaven, wore a suit, and then it wasn't until around, what, the late 60s, early 70s when he did his... Full hippie. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Full hippie, the beard, long hair, everything. And that, and then, of course, that's how most people remember him from. And it's just really interesting. There's like, you know, again, like we're getting into territory outside of the pilot, but there's another right. <laughs> like very large female comedian that pops up in, in, in the show like later on, played by Jane Lynch. And, mm-hmm. uh, um, like immediately be- 
because of because of the way they did Lenny Bruce. I'm like, like, what, is this a real person that like tricked everybody and everybody thought she was this like blue collar, overweight, you know, like, is this a real thing? I'm like looking it up and I'm like, no, it's not, you know, it's, it's, they were just able to do it so well with Lenny Bruce that like, you just kind of like, I go in now assuming like everybody that pops up and that's a real person. Mm hmm. Nice. One other thing I wanted to bring up, and then I'll, I'll turn over to Will and see if there's anything more he wants, and then back to you to let you close it out. But this is something that my mom noticed. It's just kind of like a funny thing throughout the series, but you could even see it in the pilot. Her kids are never there. <laughs> if you just watch yeah. the show with that in mind, it's almost like she's like the worst parent in the world. <laughs> she's yeah, just, just like never there for her kids. It's like she's just leading her life and her kids be there. <laughs> I, I guess I never really thought of it, but yeah, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's the right decision for the show because, you know, let's, let's be honest, kids are kind of boring in shows, but, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, it's funny if you watch it in that context, you know, like my mom pointed that out. And after that, I, we always watch that and we have like little jokes between us about how she's a really horrible mother. <laughs> she doesn't mm-hmm. like ever take care of her kids. But I thought that was just kind of a little funny thing, but it's also kind of an upper class thing. It's the idea of like, you know, that's, that's just what you have your maid for, you know? <laughs> but yeah, so Will, is there anything else you want to, to talk about from the show? Because this is your first time seeing it. It's my first time seeing it. Uh, I just want to say it was a it, it was a good show. I'm interested in watching more. Um, I think you guys covered the details pretty well. So yeah, it's pretty cool. And then uh, back to you, Nick. Anything to close it out? Probably the only thing I, I could say more is that you think the pilot is good, but the show just gets better as you watch it. Yeah. And, and, and that was the thing in, in Will, you may find this out, you know, if you continue to watch it, but for some TV shows, after you watch maybe the first season, then they sort, sort of plateau. They don't really, really reinvent themselves or really try to push the envelope and really get better. But I do think that season two is better than season one. And yeah. and when it comes to a show like uh, Marvelous Mrs. Maisel, I think it, again, as I said before, I think it's a good demonstration of how you can do a pilot for a show right and let it be introduced to the characters, but you don't try to really beat around the bush a whole lot. You, you let them see for who they really are. And then you realize that they, when things don't go their way, things start to fall apart, which I think is pretty much par for the course on, on a lot of different shows. It's a right. very structurally sound pilot. Like, it's mm-hmm. so much to the extent that, like, when we were doing this, part of me was like, if I don't have time, Marvelous Miss Maisel is the one that, or Maisel is the one that I could probably cut from having to rewatch. Not just because I'd seen it before, but even just from watching it the first time, even before seeing it the second time, even with years between, I knew everything that happened. Like, none of it had slipped my mind because it was, it's, it has such a strong, a strongly structured episode mm-hmm. that you like I it has such a such a tight narrative arc within that episode that like I yeah. knew exactly like what was good like like there was nothing that was like oh I need to refresh myself about this I wanted to watch it again just because I wanted to see if there's any little things I could pick up on having right. seen more of it now and stuff but in general just like it's so narratively tight for, for mm-hmm. a pilot episode that you really do I mean it, it could really just be like they could they could have just stopped it there and made it like a short film or something and it would have worked yeah, um, it, they, it's, they could have. it goes on and gets better, as you said, but like, it, it's such a, a structurally sound pilot. And those are kind of mm-hmm. rare. You get them every so often, but usually, I mean, when Will and I talk about pilots, I always use the term pilotitis, like it's mm-hmm. some kind of illness where like a pilot episode is just bad. And, and a lot of pilot episodes are bad because they have to do so much setup that they mm-hmm. end up actually just feeling like forced on you. And it, it just, it never works right. And, and, um, when you get to the end of the episode, you're like, uh, I don't, I don't know if I want to watch this. And, and I always call pilotitis to remind myself to always watch beyond the pilot. To always go like, okay, at least watch the second episode because of pilotitis. And I, I, I can agree with that. Marvelous Miss Maisel doesn't doesn't have pilotitis at all. It's it's very structurally sound. It, it it fits. Everything works within its own shape and context. You don't you don't. There's nothing that's like, oh, this is the scene where they have to force you to understand this bit, and this is the scene where they have to. It, it's not like that. It, it's it's very structurally sound, but it, it never like feels forced. Like like oh they're trying to like get you to understand this aspect right now like it, it doesn't feel that way it just feels more natural as you watch it so yeah it's, it's a very good pilot i also feel that because the pilot was as good as it was it made you want to j- to watch more episodes and and that's what my fiance and i did we we just binge watched it we would watch usually three or four episodes at a time and then and then yeah a few days to go by then we watch more and then before i know it, one season's done okay move on to the next one and we just kept doing that and 
it was it, it really was that engaging to keep watching it. Yeah, it's fun to have a show to, that you can really enjoy binging, but then you have to wait for season three. <laughs> yes, that's the unfortunate part. Let's move on then. Let's go on to Will's pick. Uh, Will, tell us about your show, why you picked it, what it's about. Well, the Umbrella Academy is based off an image comic book written by Gerard Way, who is the front man for My Chemical Romance. It is a superhero, a deconstruction of superhero genre, specifically the Fantastic Four, because it, like the Fantastic Four, it deals with the idea of family, and the central theme is family, and uh, the premise of this show is that it is a very dysfunctional, disunited family that are reunited after the death of their patriarch. Uh, which goes along with the title of the episode, which is we only see each other at weddings and funerals. Yes, mm-hmm. we only see each other at weddings. So, so the basic idea is the Umbrella Academy are seven siblings who were born in 1989 to women who, when the day started, were not pregnant, but they ended the day giving birth to these children. Uh, there were 45 women and 45 children, but their patriarch, a billionaire adventurer named Sir Reginald Hargreaves, traveled the world, and he only managed to get seven of these 45 children. And he raised them as the Umbrella Academy, and he raised them with the, with the goal of eventually saving the world. And there are, and there, and at the time the show starts, there are actually six of them still living because, because number six actually died previously. We don't find out how that happened in this episode. We just meet him in flashbacks and through like a, uh, the perspective of another character in an interesting way. Yes. So th- there's a lot to talk about with this. Um, yeah. like you brought up the, the Fantastic Four being the thing on it. To me, like this rings so much of X-Men. It's, it's the Academy, it, the mansion, you know, and, and I always, I, I refer to this as Wes Anderson's X-Men. Wes Anderson, it, it <laughs> is true. It, it's, it's hard to nail down because like this is, this is a pastiche. So I would say comic terms, this would be like if Grant Morrison took the X-Men and the Fantastic Four and combined them into a single comic. <laughs> <laughs> that makes perfect sense. Yeah. <laughs> and then said, here, turn this into a TV show, Wes Anderson. Yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. <laughs> there's there's a lot I, I, I really liked about this pilot and the show in general, but... Um, First off, let's, let's just talk about the, the budget on this show that must, must be exceptional. Uh, because I, I remember, I, I think I was arguing with, with Fried on, on Discord about mm-hmm. this where, where he was saying that like, um, like he was complaining about the licensed music, which I really like. I really like the use of music in this episode and yes. the theories in general. Um, I, I agree. But it, cause it's very different than what you'd don't normally get in like a comic book type show or something. Like it, it doesn't, it doesn't match with that, but it matches with this. Like, you know what I mean? Like it, it's kind of, it's, a distinguishing factor and i think it works really well with him it's really good but he was saying it as if like oh they you know they wasted all of the budget on that and i'm like wasted the budget look at pogo the chimpanzee yeah that's like amazing exactly. yeah, pogo. <laughs> yeah that like, is there's a- there's nowhere in the show you can watch and go like oh they they cheaped out here like <laughs> exactly. well, yeah you, you can't say that that monkey does not look real like i like i was telling uh i was telling tyson there was a thumbnail for a trailer and i thought based on the tr- thumbnail i thought there was a new Planet of the Apes movie that I did wasn't aware because mm-hmm. it was just Pogo and I and I forgotten about he was in this show and I was like oh like that's how good that looks so yeah every, and yeah. everything shot very well cinematography is great there's a dance mm-hmm. scene in the episode yeah. that like pulls out so you see like the the whole set of the building in like a very like stylistic way like what, how you normally see like in a comic book but you don't normally see in anything live action just because you don't really have like you know an empty half of a building like that's it be able to film it that way but they do it like in a, in a brilliant way yeah um, i thought that shot was really good yeah there, there's just a lot of good stuff with that um I also, I'm, I, there's like two performances that I really want to like single out because, uh, one, one because it's an actor I really love and I'm so happy to see him kind of see, get something more mainstream with this, you know, and get some more attention just for just how weird he is. And that's Robert Sheehan who plays, uh, uh, what, what is it? He's number four, the seance. Klaus, yes. Yeah, the seance, yeah. It's Robert Sheehan. He was from, he was in a British series called Misfits. He is just, I love that actor. He's an Irish actor and he's just like, 
off the wall. He's just just that right amount of like just weird, like I don't know, like <laughs> it's hard to like nail. And, and and he's not like an actor that like morphs into his roles. He's not like a Daniel Day Lewis where it's like you forget that you're watching Daniel Day Lewis. But I don't think that's necessarily like to say he's bad. I think that like he's definitely a he's he's a a genre actor. You know, he's like the kind of actor that like you notice and you notice the aspects of his performance that are him, but you love that about it. Well, he does a great job in this as Klaus. You know, Klaus is a, you know, he, he's a drug addict. He's also very flamboyant. Um, you know, he, he's very sarcastic. It's, it's very clear that he, he is dealing with some very personal demons. Mm-hmm. He's and very he, flamboyant, but there's like a sadness to him. Too. There's a sadness. He tries not to, he, he tries not to let on, but it's obvious, you know? Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. So that, that's, that's the first performance I want to bring up. He's, he's great. I advise anybody that like watches this and thinks that they, they think his character's funny and interesting. Watch Misfits. I think it's on Hulu. Maybe it's on Netflix now. It used to be on Hulu. Uh, this, on is, this is advocates of the shows we're talking about. <laughs> we're still advocating I'm... other shows. <laughs> Sounds like you guys could just advocate for every, every show. <laughs> <laughs> it's advocates of great television. Plural. <laughs> that is true. Uh, it's plural. But, uh, yeah. Uh, like he's he's just a great actor. He's been in a few other things too, but like the, those are the, the two main roles that you would like him in. If you liked this, like you know, the other one would be Misfits to check out. But I, I just I, I love that that actor is getting some like more eyeballs on him with this. The other performance I wanted to bring up though is like a relative newcomer, and that's the the, the kid who plays number five, the time traveler. Oh yeah, the boy, he's great. Aiden, Aiden Gallagher. Aiden yeah, Gallagher. he's phenomenal. Uh, for for like an, an early performance in his career. I mean, this isn't his first points. He's, he's been in a few other things, but he describes his character as the consciousness of a 52-year-old man in a 13-year-old's body. And that's exactly what it is. Yeah. <laughs> Reminds me of that anime series... Detective Co- Conan. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Detective Conan. He yeah. even has the same kind of pants. <laughs> yeah. He, he does. Like, he does. Wardrobe, yeah. Uh, well, Minus he, the glasses, but he, yeah. He's Detective Conan because he time travel. Well, well, what had happened was when, when the episode begins, he's been missing for 16 years because, mm-hmm. because he time jumped into the future. And then when he comes back, I love how he described it because like, he's not, he comes back and he, he describes the way he came back by, he shifted his consciousness forward in time into into an instance of himself that exists in every in every possible period in every possible permutation of time in <laughs> and that's how he managed to get back and then Diego is like that makes no sense and then he says it would if you were smarter <laughs> <laughs> which is clear I think for the viewers we're not very smart if we cannot understand it yeah yeah <laughs> I think since there are like seven key figures it would kind of uh, make sense to kind of just go through them and just kind of Briefly explain them and kind of our oh, reactions yeah, to them. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to do. Well, there's there's Ellen Page who plays the Daniel. Well, I was going to say, let's start with number one. <laughs> we got a nice numerical order. Oh, okay. Well, fine. <laughs> I, I got a list in front of me, so I can name them off and then you can describe <laughs> Tyson them. Tyson has it all figured out. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so number one, Luther Hargreaves, also known as Space Boy. Yes, so Space Boy. Well, he, he is big and he's strong and he goes to space. Uh, we don't really learn much about him this episode other than those facts, right? He's... he's He's like the Cyclops character. Yeah, he's like he's the like Cyclops. the like super loyal, super by the book. Yeah, okay. he like, presents himself as the leader, and and he thinks that there is some something suspicious going on surrounding his father's death. You know, um, even though like everybody's telling him it was natural death, it was a heart attack. There's nothing suspicious. He won't let go of this notion. Yeah, he's and, played by uh, Tom Hooper from Game of Thrones. He played Samwell's brother in Game of Thrones. And that and this brings him into conflict. Like with Diego because number two, yeah, number two. Okay, also known as the Kraken. Okay, great, thank you. <laughs> go on, go go on up about the, the Kraken now. <laughs> <laughs> go on about the Kraken. Well, geez, well, yes. So now that you bring it up, Diego Hargreaves is the Kraken. He is he is rebellious. Uh, he has kind of a chip on his shoulder. He doesn't like his dad a lot. You know, no, yeah, he's, <laughs> he's kind of the the agitator of the group. He, he he's like the Batman of the group because he he really loves uh, going out. And kicking the shit out of criminals. Yeah, he is. He, and he's the brooder too. And he's he, the brooder. Yeah, so he, he is the Batman character of the series. <laughs> because yeah, he he's all broody and he just likes to stick his fist in people's faces for like that's how he get, gets his kicks. And his dynamic yeah. with Spaceway is is kind of like I I mentioned Spaceway being kind of like the Cyclops of the group. Well, not 
necessarily for the character itself for Diego, but in his relationship with Luther. It's the Wolverine. Diego is the Wolverine. Yeah, yeah Diego Makes is sense. the Wolverine. Yeah. <laughs> there's, there's, there's a scene where Diego and Space Boy get into a, a fight, you know, when, at, at their father's funeral. Mm-hmm. Yeah, pretty pretty uh, uh, vicious brawl with superpowers involved. And then, we have next is uh, number okay, three. Number three, Allison Hargreaves, the rumor. Uh, she has the power to manipulate reality by by telling by spreading rumors by just saying saying something and making it true. Right. So all she has to do is say the phrase "I heard a rumor" and then say whatever she wants, and it becomes true. Yeah, they they show a scene when they're younger and they're saving like there's a bank robbery going on and and they get uh. They're going in to, like, stop it, and she said, I heard a rumor that you shot your friends. Yeah. <laughs> and the guy's like, what are you talking about? Start shooting his friends. <laughs> she, she's also a celebrity. She's, like, a celebrity movie star, you know, because... Did you course, hear a rumor about that? Get started on that point. Yeah. <laughs> Did you hear a rumor that she's famous? <laughs> Ooh, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, that's that's probably what happened. <laughs> <laughs> she's, uh, uh, and she also has kind of a, a quasi-romantic she entanglement seems, with Space Boy. She seems pretty down to earth for uh, for a rich girl who could literally get anything she wants. Yeah, that's that's yeah. surprising. You see that? Yeah, you know that, that's surprising. Uh, I, I think she's matured past that a little bit. I think I that's. Think so. Well, uh, didn't she make a mention? She made a mention. I think that well, she hadn't done. I think done the rumor thing for quite some time or something like that. It's almost like oh, she's trying to put it. Ahead. You kind of yeah. see why as the show goes on. I've seen the, I, the full show for this, and and uh, you you kind of understand why she. She hasn't used it in a while. I would, I would imagine so. <laughs> uh, this is one of the, uh, like, I'll just bring this up real quick. This is one of the reasons why, like, I'm a little nervous about season two because season one is so good, but it's a lot of what makes it so good is that it's so deeply personal that, like, you wonder, like, how can you stay so deeply personal? Like, you, you have another story, but how do you keep it grounded as such a personal story the way that season one is? And I, I don't know. I'm not saying it's not going to be. I don't really have much experience with the comics or anything. Um, and, and it might be just just as personal, if not more so, but it, it always makes me a little nervous. I had kind of the same feeling after season one of Dexter, the way that went and being such a personal story for Dexter. But yeah. it's and, it's and, uh, and that became a mixed bag. Yeah, uh, definitely. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so the next step is number four. We'd already talked about him, Klaus Harvey. Uh, yes, Klaus. But yeah, we've already yeah. talked about him. We didn't we didn't really mention his power though. I mean, it's kind of obvious when with his name Seance, but yeah, he can he can commune with the dead. Yeah, you know, he can summon the dead and talk to them and commune with them. There's a point where Space Boy, who is still suspicious, who is suspicious about the circumstances surrounding his father's death, asks Klaus to summon his dad and ask him, and Klaus, Klaus balks at that. He's like, no way. It also, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this is, you this expect is, me to do that? Yeah. His, his power seems to be kind of the contributing factor to his drug problems. Right. And that this is something that kind of like haunts him. Right. And, and he doesn't enjoy this, and, and, he, and he has so much trouble with it that it, it led to his drug problem and so he's like never sober so like he's like he's like how can you expect me to do this and, and luther's like oh because you're you know you're high and he's like well yeah i'm high <laughs> like yeah. you know yeah, high. Exactly. Uh, number five, we'd already talked about a little bit before too, is the boy. He's the only one without a name of all the characters, like an actual, like, human regular name. He's just number five or the boy. And, and he starts out where his power is. He, he can, he can move between spaces. So he can literally, like, teleport around. He, he eventually figures out a way to move through time. And that's how he gets stuck in the future for 16 years. He has the most badass power, I think, that we've seen in the pilot and and, yeah. and I love like this this is another example of how teleporting can be so awesome in like fight scenes and stuff yes and yes. yeah and, and this he has a fight scene in this as a kid fighting a bunch of armed adults and mm-hmm. just kicking their asses to the tune of uh, Istanbul by the they might be giants I love that I love <laughs> that was a really good music choice for that that was yeah. a really good music choice I love that scene that was without that. without spoiling anything he has another similar kind of fight scene another teleport friendly fight scene set to Don't Stop Me Now by Queen. Yeah. <laughs> so he's got, he's got the music picks are in his favor. Sounds uh, like it's a, a sequel to Shaun of the Dead at that point. He, <laughs> he, he's a character who moves the central plot forward because he tells uh, number seven, mm-hmm. Vanya, he tells Vanya that when he went to the future, he saw that the world was basically destroyed and there was nothing left and that that future was eight days from where they are now. Yes. 
in, in, in the that part of the story is is featured throughout the season as well. Like it, you see a lot of the future as well, a lot of the barren, destroyed future that you just kind of get a brief glimpse of in this episode. But yeah, uh, next up is number six, Ben Hargreaves, the crack or the horror. I'm sorry, the horror. Uh, yeah, the horror. Yes, uh, <laughs> he's he's kind of the Lovecraftian superpower. <laughs> well, we, we don't we don't see it because we we only see the only hint we get of this is like he goes into a big vault as a child, and then we see like these glimpses of like these tentacles and people screaming, and then he comes out of it all covered in blood and, yeah. and looking like he never wants to do that again. I, I believe his his line is something like, uh, "Can we go home now?" Yeah, <laughs> don't let me do that again. Yeah. Uh, he he is he is dead when 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 we pick up in the present day. We don't know the circumstances of his death or how he dies. Nobody really talks about it. There's a statue of him. They just allude the to it being horrible. Yeah, they allude to it being bad. Mm-hmm. Like, and the, yeah, there's a statue of him as a remembrance. And we and the only other time we see him is when is when Klaus is talking to him in the back of Diego's car. He seems yes. to be like Klaus can summon people to commune with. He doesn't like doing it, but the one that's kind of seems to be there a lot. That even when he's not summoning their, them to be there with him is Ben. So I get and the, throughout I, the series. So so I so I get the uh, impression that Klaus and Ben were probably especially close as children. Probably. Mm. I think they both had powers that they didn't like. Right. They well. were pro- they were pro- they, that's probably the connection. They were probably both equally haunted by their powers and so they formed a bond over that. Yes. Makes sense. And then lastly, we have number seven, Vanya Hargreaves, who has the amazing power of Nada. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. She has no powers. Wink, wink. Well, I'm not going to spoil anything more, but she apparently has no powers. Let's just put it like that. When, whenever you see a character of that <laughs> type, the, the one person born in the exact same circumstance, and they don't have a power, that's like, it's always like an obvious that something's going to, that's going to play into the plot at some point, you know? But her, in fact, her uh, yeah, her character is is because because she apparently has no power. She's been left out of everything that the other children were doing. Her her father, Reginald Hargreaves, kept her away from all the Umbrella Academy business. Constantly told her that she wasn't special, and that's why she wasn't participating. Uh, her supportive father. <laughs> yes, he he just said you're not special, <laughs> and, and and so basically she feels alienated from the rest of the family in a way. You know. Yes. I, I wanted to bring up that it's uh, I had mentioned because Robert Sheehan is in this playing Klaus. I had mentioned Misfits. His character in Misfits falls into that same trope as like the one character in the same situation who, who quotation mark doesn't have powers, right? And then how that e- eventually plays into things later on. So that's like the case in Misfits as well. But yeah, it, it's those are the seven characters, and as you know, that like I said, the story is very personal as it develops. It sticks very much to the theme of this family and and the relationship between those characters as it progresses through the season. It's a very good season. I've heard some people have complaints that they, they thought that throughout the season it started to get to like lose focus. I think what that is is that those people wanted the plot to develop faster. And the plot kind of takes a backseat to the to the character drama between the family members, which I thought was the best part of the show to me. Right. Um so for me I loved it. And then, you know, when the story kind of does start to kick back up in the second half of the season or towards the end of the season and like then it that has so much more emotional relevance because of the that time they put into showing the relationships between the characters. So yeah, I I really enjoyed uh, this episode. I really enjoyed the series. A uh, lot, okay. lot, lot, lot to look forward to. It's funny because like two of the best characters like don't even show up until the next episode. Okay, I want to hear uh, Nick's take on the show now uh, because now that I've seen it. I obviously love it. I was pretty familiar with the material already. I believe Nick, you weren't. Familiar familiar with this at all before going into it, right? Correct. I, I didn't did not even know it was a comic book. <laughs> so I, I went into it completely blind and actually I did that on purpose. Uh, both with this show and the next show that Tyson will talk about in a little bit. And I came away with it, just enthralled with it, and just thinking, this is quite interesting. I really want to dive in and, and watch more of it. And that was actually one, one of the other shows that uh, my fiance and I, just we just sat down just to watch it. And, and she was also interested in it as well. So that might be our, our next show to binge, I imagine. Your we'll next see. binge. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but what I'm I like... Oh, sorry. Uh, what I thought was also interesting, though, is 
from the very beginning, from the very opening shot, when Ellen Page's character is on the violin playing the music, and I just that opening scene with the music in the background and all the I can't even remember half the stuff that even happened, but I just remember really digging that opening scene. And then, of course, you know, you're mentioning how well she has no powers. Well, she obviously has skills with a violin, so there's that. Yeah, definitely. And, that does a great rendition of uh, Phantom of the Opera. Yes, uh, yeah, because I I I I don't know a lot of Phantom of the Opera. Um, but my fiance does, and she immediately picked up on it that, oh, this is Phantom of the Opera. So it, it was, I'm sure there's maybe some underlying reasons also why they chose that, but regardless of the reason, it was a definitely a good choice to how to start the show. Yeah, so uh, is that pretty much it for, for Umbrella Academy? Yeah. Sounds, sounds like you guys are both uh, going to continue on with it. I've already watched it, and I'm already eagerly awaiting season two. <laughs> Damn you and your free time. <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> Who's got time anymore? I had free time. <laughs> this is all before when I had free time. <laughs> uh, so next up is my pick. I picked Rectify, which is, of all these shows, Rectify is a complete series. It's done. It's it's a few years older. I think it came out in 2013, I think was in the first episode aired. Um, and that's what we are covering, the first episode. It's titled Always There. This is a show that, like, I remember when I first heard about it, like, I saw, like, some video of it, and I was kind of like, it, it didn't really grab me immediately. The thing that got me was that it said it was some of the producers that were involved in Breaking Bad Mm -hmm. that were involved in this. I said, okay, I gotta give this a shot because of that. And I ended up becoming completely intrigued by like like one key aspect of the show. And that's that this is a show about somebody who was in prison and now his his sentence has been vacated, but he's not, um, he he hasn't been, uh, 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 what's the word? Uh, (laughs) Exonerated? (laughs) Yes. I was was just gonna say what's the word that Donald Trump keeps throwing around in correctly. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, he has not been exonerated uh, from from the crime that uh, he's guilty of. He's also somebody who, when he was convicted of the crime, he confessed to it and everything, except that as you watch in the episode, that was, do- like, he doesn't, and, and at no point does he cite that he like, knows for sure whether he did it or not. He doesn't have any memory of whether he did it or not. He was just convinced that he had done it. But the thing that makes the show so interesting to me is that that's not what the show's even about. The show's not about out, like, did he do this crime or not, or who did this crime? That's that's in the show, but it's not what it's about. The show's about what it means to go from a life where you're like on death row for you know more than half your life because he was in prison for for about twenty years and he went in like right out basically when he was like in high school. Mm-hmm. So like he spent like half his life on in death row, not just prison, but death row, where he was facing execution, thinking he was going to die, not had with no memory of of if he did this or not, regardless of if he did or not. He has no memory of it and and how you adjust from that to the outside world especially adjusting to that the outside world in a small town where everybody knows who he is and and like there's no escaping it there's nothing and that's a lot of that's you know not necessarily in the pilot that stuff you get later but you get little hints of it like just with the way (laughs) the whole system's basically out to put him back in the jail as you can see like the sheriff and the the former da who's now like a, a senator up for the state. He's basically made his career off of, off of this case. And that's why he's a senator in the first place. And, and so he's like just desperately wants him back in prison. He desperately doesn't want to be proven wrong. Yes. Like it, to him, it doesn't matter if he is right or wrong. He doesn't want to, it to be seen that he's proven wrong because his whole career is based on his career. Exactly. He exactly. He has personal interest vested in this that's biasing him and he is a terrible person. Yes. And that, that's what I think is interesting about the show is that that's what the show's about. It's not, it's not so much. I mean, like I said, they do go into the idea of if he did it or not and stuff. That is definitely in the show. But that's not what it's about. It's about like everything around that. It's about like adjusting to life outside. It's about people who made their careers on him being guilty that don't care if he is or isn't guilty. Right. Uh, and, and it's about like living in a small town where everybody knows the story. Like everybody there. It's it's inescapable. And that, that's like what this and, and it's about family, you know, and it's about mixed families. The idea of like, you know, uh, uh, families where, where the they've been remarried, you know, and, and then you have step siblings added into this equation and what that means. That's that's like what this show is about. And uh, I, I'm just happy I was able to force two other people to watch this show. So I'm not the only person who's ever seen it. Well, some, some people must have watched it. It got four seasons, according to Netflix. Yes, so, it, it got four seasons, but it was like a Sundance show or something. Yeah, it was on the Sundance channel, yeah. I had actually heard of the 
this show previously, but I didn't really know much about it, to be honest. Uh, I didn't really look into it too much. Same uh, here. Yeah, it, it's a good show. Uh, it's kind of a hard show to watch at first because of the subject matter and also because of of how slow it is. It is a slow show. Yeah. But it's very meditative, too. It's yeah, like... it's very meditative. Mm-hmm. It, it's like the character. The character himself is very meditative. Some of the scenes I love the most were the scenes from Flashbacks in Prison where he's communicating with this other prisoner yeah. in the yes. cell next to him. I really love those scenes. Those interactions were great. Yes, yeah, so there's, there's kind of two prisoners that he heavily interacts with that you see in, in Flashbacks. You saw them both in this episode, mostly it's it's this friend of his that he's that he's making in this in this prison. And remember, this is death row, so they're all yeah. like there to die, you know. Right. And uh, um, so so it's the friendship he's striking up with this guy, who, by the way, I don't know if you noticed, Will, that that is uh, uh, Gustav from Brain Dead. Okay, I I noticed, I recognized him from somewhere, but I could never place that. Okay. Brain Dead uh, Nick is, is a show also starring. This is this is how it links to all the shows now. Uh, it, it, <laughs> also in um uh, oh, oh, marvelous Miss Maisel. Oh, Oh, <laughs> Marvelous Miss Maisel had Tony Shalhoub, who who is in Brain Dead as well. Brain Dead's a good show that was on CBS. That's basically about how things are getting too political. Like this happened like before Trump kind of became a serious candidate. This was the no, this was this was the fall. this is like when he first started running. No, this, 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 this aired the fall of t- or summer 2016. So oh, it did. Okay, in yeah. The middle of yeah, this was towards the end of the 2016 election cycle. So he was they were he was already entrenched as a candidate when this show came on. But he wasn't. I remember when the show came on. He wasn't yet the the Republican nominee. I I think the show was set a little behind to where we were at. Like, yeah, yeah. But, but the show was about like how divisive the, the politics had gotten, basically. And it was a funny show where like it was explaining that and basically saying why why is everybody getting so divisive? Why are politics so dirty? Because of aliens. Yeah. And yeah. so it was like, like kind of a parody of of politics getting so divisive and adding in alien bugs as the reason why. But yeah, one of the main characters in that show is the guy who plays this this other prisoner that he's friends with in in this. And as as we mentioned, Tony Shalhoub from uh from Miss Maisel is is also in brain death. <laughs> so so it all links together but uh, <laughs> but uh it's all one universe yes <laughs> it's all yeah it's one connected universe it's, the mcu has nothing on this but yeah, like there's that that prisoner, and then the second prisoner is different. He's he's and he's an antagonistic element, and he's okay. the one that was kind of like you know heckling the um the the other guy when he got into prison uh-huh. when they showed him being booked. You know, like he's he's a a nasty piece of work, <laughs> and he he's he's very antagonistic to both of them. Those two prisoners are like the basis of kind of his his time in prison that you'll see a lot of in, in flashbacks throughout the series. But um yeah, I. I really like that as well. I like when you you learn kind of how he got into so many like books and stuff and there was because of like one person in his town that like owned a bookstore that started bringing him books when he was in prison and stuff and like how that affected him and there's there's all this stuff that's interesting stuff that you don't get into yet in the pilot that that kind of explains certain things like that. But um okay. I definitely I, I really like his character because he is very introspective, the lead, I mean. And and he's very much like like you can see the elements of, of the fact that he's kind of always been like this kind of introspective poetic soul. It's not just been since prison because like they even show when it, when it has like the senator and the sheriff and the guy who ended up finding him um, after the crime and stuff. They're talking about the crime itself and they said like, yeah, when, when they found him, he didn't know where he was or what he was doing, but he was collecting wild flowers and putting them in her hair or something. And it's like, that's just who he is. <laughs> like, that's who Daniel Holden is. As you watch the show, you realize that, you know? That that's who he is. That's, you know, he's gonna wax philosophic and he's gonna put flowers in a girl's hair you know that's like who he is when i was watching him and as he got out and he's observing his surroundings and he's giving his little speech you were talking about uh this is uh, when we were uh, chatting on discord how there's a lot of complex emotions and one of the emotions i i got from it from the beginning was that he it just looked like he had no soul like his soul had left him because he'd been in prison for so long in death row and then he doesn't really know how to react anymore and, and so that he has to kind of reinvent himself as someone who is not behind bars anymore. And th- that was my initial take on that, it, anyway. Right. Yeah, th- that's definitely a part of uh, of his story, is that he is, he's, I don't know if it's that he has no soul or that he's lost his soul because of prison, but it's more like he's he's put up these kind of walls. He's become very solitary. Uh, and yeah, like he, you could see that when he's doing his, his speech, like he's, you can see where he puts in an effort to make like a joke and then he's realizing that maybe 
maybe it's coming across inappropriately or something. And he, he's realizing the way everybody's looking at him and he kind of, you see like his whole face change, you know? And mm-hmm. it, it's that moment of, of kind of like he had a, a brief respite from, from who he was and like immediately took it back, you know? So that, that, that's a part of his character as well. It, it's, and it's, you also see in how hard it is for him to kind of reconnect with people. I mean, it's very awkward, almost cringy when he's like, you know, spending time with his, his half brother, um, who's, who, who wants, who's kind of tr- looking up to him as like a brother he, who he never knew. And, and he's like, Oh, you know, I, here's a TV with a DVD player in it. You know, I mainly just watch like, you know, Netflix now or something, but he's all like, give you some DVDs and you can watch, you know, and, and he's trying to like watch a movie with him and stuff and it's that kind of like you could see a genuine effort on both parts uh, both on both parties to try to connect with each other but there's like this they don't know each other you know they're family but they don't know each other at all Mm -hmm. and that that's like a big part of the you know like i said the story is is about that kind of the effects of prison and and you know being isolated and then and then just suddenly being thrown back into life Nice. In the in the bigger plot, the actual like story, like I said, it's not really about the mystery, but you start to get clues of that as well. And that in, in which you see like two of the witnesses that basically said that he's the one that did it two boys his age they end up kind of meeting up towards the end of the episode and they talk about you know like they're they're neither one is sure if the other one did it or not or if it was daniel that did it and it ends like the episode ends with one of them killing himself and because he he's you know everything's coming back to this moment in his life and it's like you can tell that that's a character that probably never got over what happened when he was a kid whereas the other one is a little bit sociopathic and kind of seems to have just immediately gotten over it uh the incident that occurred and mm-hmm. and uh yeah that that plays into the story as well and there's there's a lot with there so i'm just interested like what was your general takeaway from the from from the episode uh, i enjoyed it uh definitely it it is a heavy drama so it's not something i can just put on at any time you know when it's definitely I not to... something you binge. <laughs> binge unless unless you're like really feel like feeling depressed yeah, it, it's it's not something you made, so it's not something you casually put on. But if you're looking for deeper, you know, more thoughtful, more philosophical stuff, that's definitely a great show to watch. I think so. And Nick, yeah, I honestly, I mean, I I thought that the premise of the show was definitely intriguing enough that yeah, I could probably watch more of this. But like what Will was saying, I think getting into the right mindset to watch it because it is very heavy, it is very deep, and it could probably mentally drain you after a while. I think it's like Mad Men in a way. <laughs> in a way, in a way. I know there's this is a little off topic here, but uh, but my fiance and I we've been watching documentaries uh, lately, and one of the ones we're watching right now was actually the recent Vietnam War documentary, and it's like a eleven or twelve part series. And after one episode now, which is about an hour and a half to two hours, that's all we can that's all we can muster to watch. We can't we can't do anymore. There's just too much that happens. Yeah, and, <laughs> and, and then too much. You just kind of go, wow, did it's- all. Too much really, that sits with you, yeah. Exactly. And I think this type of show with Rectify, I think, is kind of the same way. Although, interestingly, I thought it was I, because it was a Sundance show and not one that was on Hulu or Netflix. It's it's a short, it's shorter episodes than, you know, in the standard hour. So you could watch yeah. mul- multiple episodes and not really have a lot of time go by. Yeah, but, yeah. It's like 45 minutes an episode, standard right. like cable. No, I, especially towards the, the end of the pilot of the first episode, it definitely Definitely makes you wonder, you know, oh, wh- where is this all going to lead up to, and and how are the different characters are going to cope, especially the people in law enforcement. How are they going to cope with the fact that this man is now no longer behind bars, and how the family is going to adjust? So there's definitely a lot to unpack for just that one episode. And of course, you, you said there's what four seasons? I think you said. Yeah. So it's <laughs> yeah. There it, it, there's I, I don't watch a lot of the drama heavy shows as much. I know one, and also again, I'll look going off topic here, but another one of those shows that I've been told to watch for, for years is Six Feet Under. And it's one of those, some of those really heavy drama shows that you really do have to get into the mindset of them, like Will was talking about. And they're going to put you in a place, whether you want to be or not. <laughs> right. And then, and then you go to bed just feeling like crap afterwards because you, you, <laughs> you just think like, wow, is that what my life could be like? Or, you know, you need to start thinking about stuff outside of it. But so it, it was a good show. It was definitely very intriguing enough that I do want to check it out more. I hope you do because it's, it's a really good show. And it's like I said, I, I always feel like I'm the only person on earth who's seen it. <laughs> 
but yeah, it's it's uh it's good. One other thing I wanted to bring up before we uh, ended the conversation on this show is, did you notice uh, that his lawyer, that his new lawyer, the one that's that's kind of has a quasi romantic relationship with his sister, mm-hmm. is Lenny Bruce from Marvel's Swiss Maisel? Yes, okay, so. oh, I noticed. I did notice that. <laughs> Again, it's all connected. <laughs> it's all connected. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. So uh, and and his his uh, stepbrother, the one that's kind of being played off as an asshole right now, is the guy that got kicked off of Lethal Weapon for apparently being an asshole. <laughs> mm-hmm. So if you ever if you were heard about that controversy like last year on TV, you know uh, uh, that that yeah, was but... that was that that actor apparently had a they had issues between him and like Damon Wayans and stuff on the Lethal Weapon TV show. But uh, yeah. So uh, that's it for Recta. Advocates of great television. All right. Uh, now, uh, towards the end of our podcast here, and now we finished up Advocates, um, I have a, a little bit of a quiz that I wanted to play through. So this is a quiz about the podcast. So don't, don't feel like pressure to know that we're not like playing for points or prizes or anything. It's mostly yeah. just trivia for fun, you know? We're playing for our lives. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you're right. This is, this is a death match trivia. One, one, one of us will die and the winner will become the new co-host. So, so what we'll do is, uh, I'll, I'll call it, I'll, I'll say the question and then, you guys can just kind of pipe in when you, if you know the answer to it, or if you just want to take a wild guess in the dark. So, first off, uh, question number one. In episode one of this podcast, what is the first news piece we discussed? How am I supposed to remember that? <laughs> <laughs> it, sounds, it sounds like a real shot in the dark, you know? I mean, it's uh, like, I don't know. Hey, Maybe I've talking about talking yeah, about David show. Tennant being cast in Jessica Jones or something. I don't know. That's actually it. Oh, okay. Wow. Oh, wow. What the <laughs> he got a shot in the dark. I guess you kind of know what kind of podcast we do. I, I, I guess you talk about television, so I guess that is something to talk about with television. That's actually that. That's the first topic we discussed on this podcast. We before we got into any show discussion, we did a few news stories, and the first one we did was about David Tennant being cast in Jessica Jones. You remember that conversation a little bit? We were talking to uh, Cat. Was announced that long ago? Damn. Yeah, that was how it, long it, this podcast been going. Two hundred episodes. It's been a while. Jeez, it yeah. doesn't even feel like that show's been around that long. Because <laughs> it's only had the, the what the two seasons so far. The third one. Yeah. Third First one. season was really good. First yeah. season was good. Third one is coming soon. It's going to be the last one. Yeah. So it, and it's already canceled. Pretty <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> canceled. Yeah. Uh, so question number two. In which episode did we first play this game, Advocates of Great Television, and who were the participants? Uh, oh, geez. Uh, Kat was one of the participants. It was me, you, Kat, somebody else, I'm sure. And it was probably around episode, I, I don't know, 50? Let's see, uh, episode 10, in, as far as the participants, Tyson, Will, you said Cat. Okay, how about Lee? That's actually correct. Okay. You're apparently a big fan of this podcast. I, I guess. I guess. <laughs> yes. You've been listening. You're, you're to nailing me. these. I think oh. you're psychic. <laughs> I, it could be. It could be <laughs> psychic. Who knows? My memory is terrible too, so that's also another thing. All right. So our next question up here, question number three: With Game of Thrones returning for its eighth and final season, on which episode of the podcast did we conclude our coverage of season seven? Okay. So this is episode two hundred. We're on right now. So what episode was the last time we talked about a Game of Thrones episode? It was Game of Thrones skipped a year, right? Yeah. So Jesus Christ, that was like uh, 20, 2017, right? Spring, season 7 aired in like summer of 2017, right? Uh, uh, yes, I believe so. Yeah, so I'm not good with math. So if we're <laughs> at episode 200 now, I, I'm going to say somewhere around somewhere around like uh, 100, somewhere around episode 100. It's fairly close. Can you do any better, Nick? Nine. Um, 97. Let's put a hard number on it. I'll go go a little higher. Um, How about 123? That's exactly on. What the hell? What the hell? What? How did (laughs) that was the the last time we discussed a Game of Thrones episode? Was episode 123? That was season 7, episode 7. Okay. This is crazy. This is, this is. We got one question left, so we got to see if the luck holds out here. Okay, yeah, yeah. Okay, so question number four. On what day will this episode that we're recording right now be edited and distributed? Oh, geez. You, you do, you, you distribute these on Mondays. Okay. Right? Can you, can you 
you be more specific, uh, Nick? Uh, what do you mean? You want me to give you a specific date? It's like this Monday. It's like the first of the month. <laughs> April, April Fools, Will. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I got got. I wanted to do some kind of a trivia thing on the show. I always want to, and I can never think of a, a way to properly do it. And as I was considering that, what to do, it, it dawned on me that I'd be editing this podcast and putting it up on April Fools. <laughs> and I said, "Oh God, I gotta, I gotta do like a fake trivia thing." But all the answers are real. I just fed them off the neck. <laughs> no, he gave them to me like two hours before this. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I knew. Like, like I, I kind of I kind of worked that out like that's what was happening because obviously there's like no way that you, you don't know you, you know the answers to all this when you don't have no knowledge of the podcast like what are you saying you say I don't have a, I don't have a good memory <laughs> <laughs> you, you you would have to have some memory first <laughs> well it's obvious watching watching these three shows I don't have much of a memory just listening to you guys ago oh yeah I didn't think about that oh that makes perfect sense <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I wanted to do that. We did we did trivia one time before, but it, I think it only really worked out well because that was an episode where we had discussed. Um, I think we were doing like Daredevil season two or something, or we were doing one of the Marvel shows, and I did the all the trivia was about the Marvel shows, and so everybody was kind of like you know knowledgeable to, to kind of to, to go on that, and that was pretty fun. And I, I I've never been sure on on how to do it again since then, but I've always wanted to do it, and uh, yeah, I decided to do it in a funny way. <laughs> But that's pretty much it for the show. All we have left is to talk about what's coming up in the week ahead. So we're recording this on Friday, March 29th. And today, Hannah came to Amazon Prime. This is the first episode they put up right after the Super Bowl. And uh, they dropped the rest of the season today. So you guys can check that out if you want. Hannah is based on the movie of the same name. And it's kind of about a, a girl who's kind of abducted from a, a government thing when she's like a baby and trained to kill the government people. So that's not the best way oh, I can okay. do that show. Yeah, <laughs> so that came that came to Amazon Prime today. Um, Harlots returns to Hulu. Osmosis comes to Netflix. On My Block starts its second season on Netflix. The Santa Clarita Diet has returned on Netflix. I say this as somebody who currently resides in Santa Clarita. <laughs> and uh, Traders mm-hmm. returns to Netflix. Then on Sunday, March 31st, 2019, Call the Midwife is back on PBS. Miss Wilson, a new miniseries, is also on PBS. Barry returns to HBO. This is the show about uh, yeah, what's the actor's name? Well, do you remember? <laughs> oh, oh, Bill, Bill Hader. Hader. Yes, it's about it's Bill Hader, and he plays an assassin who uh, ends up getting involved in an, uh, like a an acting class, like a uh, what do you call it? improv, like acting or something. And and now he wants to become an actor, so he's juggling his his job as a hitman with wanting to be an actor in this class. And <laughs> is that show a comedy or is it a drama? It's one of those ones that's labeled as a comedy, and it can definitely be funny at times, but it's also like very it can leave you depressed. <laughs> okay, because when you said Bill Hader, I'm thinking that guy. <laughs> it's definitely it's a it's a comedy, but it's like a very dark comedy, like okay. to the point where it can be very dramatic at times. Um, it's got it's got a pretty good cast though. Besides Bill Bill Hader, it's also got um yeah, Henry Winkler is in it. He plays like the acting coach, and mm-hmm. uh, yeah, there's there's a few people. There's there's a lot of like I said, there's a lot of funny stuff, but there's a lot a lot of like messed up stuff too. <laughs> um, Veep also returns to HBO. Uh, that's with uh, Julia Louise Dreyfus, where she plays now. It's called Beat, but she's like I think the president now in the show. I haven't watched it in a few seasons. Okay. The Taste of Daisies comes to Netflix, and Trailer Park Boys is getting an animated series on Netflix. Really? Just random as hell. <laughs> that yeah. is really random. So uh, on Monday, April first, besides this podcast being released, and besides it being April Fool's Day, Cannon Busters, the anime, comes to Netflix. As does Ultraman. Uh, this is their their CG version of Ultraman that they've been touting for quite a while now. DC's Legends of Tomorrow returns to the CW, which is probably the last of the DC CW shows that has any joy left in it. <laughs> and the Twilight Zone starts on CBS All Access. This is the version that's being hosted by Jordan Peele. So besides uh, Star Trek, you finally have another reason to get CBS All Access, the Twilight Zone. Nice, nice. <laughs> I heard speaking. Yay. <laughs> Pretty much everything Jordan Peele does is, is kind of put up on a pedestal now, like to the point where it's like, I think a lot of it's deserved, but like... Like, you just can't tell. <laughs> well, I heard Us is really good. I'm really looking forward yeah. to that. 
Ever ever since he did uh, uh what was the 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 one he did before us the get out yeah get out ever since he did get out he's become like kind of a bulletproof figure you know <laughs> like everybody wants to see what he does next kind of thing so yeah I mean I've heard really good things about it too I think I'll eventually get a CBS All Access trial if if only to watch uh um the Star Trek stuff and then check out Twilight Zone as well mm-hmm. lots of good stuff yeah Tuesday April second two thousand nineteen the last OG returns to TBS this is the one with a uh, Tracy Jordan in it. So, yeah. Tr- Tracy Morgan. You know. Tracy Morgan, yeah. Tracy yeah, Jordan was his character in, in uh, 30 Rock. 30 Rock, yeah. Let's see. Uh, it did, did not sound right. <laughs> it was the name of the character he played in 30 Rock, though, which is funny. My mind jumped to the character, but yeah, that's that's the one where he plays like he uh, a guy who went to prison for dealing drugs and now he's trying to reconnect with his family. It's a straight up comedy, though. It's not like Rectify. <laughs> mm-hmm. It's straight up comedy, but yeah. Um, then on Wednesday, April 3rd, Brockmire returned turns to IFC. On Thursday, April 4th, In the Dark comes to the CW. That's the new drama about a, a blind woman. Uh, Marvel's Cloak and Dagger comes back for its second season on Freeform. And the miniseries Unspeakable comes to Sundance. And then lastly, on Friday, April 5th, 2019, Yes, It's Really Us Singing, the Crazy Ex-Girlfriend concert special airs what? on the CW. So that, that season just recently concluded, and they're going to have like a musical special, a live special kind of thing. Uh, to kind of close it out. Okay, interesting. Also, Our Planet, the miniseries, comes to Netflix. This is very much like Planet Earth, if you've watched that. I think it's the same people who made Planet Earth, in fact. Um, you some David Attenborough. Uh, yeah. The narrating, I like that. It is David Attenborough on this one as well, I believe. Um, they, they just, they're like, they're, they're feeding him like lion's blood to keep him around long enough to narrate every documentary on nature. <laughs> 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 you know, in the future, after he passes on, they are just going to use clips and voice samples to to create new narration for future documentaries into eternity. There's probably enough that they could just like, you know, Google could like recreate his voice and his cadence and stuff and then they could yeah. just program it. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, he, it, that's coming back to Netflix. I always look at like anytime something in the Planet Earth series or from that group of people like comes, it's I'm excited this is coming because uh, we just got a new TV. We just got a 4K HDR TV and that means oh, nice. <laughs> that's what Planet Earth was for our old TV. It was like, how are we going to test out our HD TV? Well, Planet Earth. It's weird because they have Planet Earth on Blu-ray, and I've watched, I think, the first or second of the parts of it. I've not watched it all on Blu-ray, so <laughs> now you're going to make, now gonna, I'm going to have to watch the rest of it. <laughs> you're just going to watch and be hypnotized by the, like, beautiful photography. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm excited to watch Our Planet with 4K HDR on Netflix, so that's going to be exciting. Also on April 5th, and already, this is, it just surprises me at how fast this is coming. Season 2 of The Chilling Adventures of Sabrina. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that that came out, the last season came out in October. They had yeah. a Christmas special in December. And now, now the season is- 2 is in April. Yeah. That's just crazy. But, that, is, uh, that is crazy. Uh, it looks wild. I saw the trailer. Looks great. Looks fantastic. Yeah, yeah. looks I looks can't. dark as ever. Looks great. Yeah. Quicksand is coming to Netflix, along with Tijuana. Warrior is coming to Cinemax, and The Tick is back for its second season. It feels kind of like its third, but if you remember, its first season was broken up into two parts on Amazon. Yeah, yeah. So, season two on Amazon Prime of The Tick. And that's it for what's coming up in the week ahead. So, uh, until then, next week we're going to return to Fillory. We're going to talk about magicians. We're going to do a double episode. We're going to talk about this week's episode, which was another musical episode, and uh, next week's episode, which I haven't seen any previous for so I have no idea what that episode is. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm gonna. I haven't watched either of them yet, so I'm, I'm gonna have to get that ready for the next uh, episode. But yeah, back to Fillory, back to the magicians. Until then, you can reach me on Twitter. I'm at Tyson Gifford. You can reach Will. He is at Voxel Hero. Nick, do you have any like social media links or names or anything you want to share or any other projects you're working on? Uh, I mean, t- yeah, I'm on you know Twitter, but I don't really use it that often. So join the uh, club. <laughs> we always yeah. plug our Twitter handles, and we never use. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You know, I don't really have anything much to plug. All I can really say is, uh, Tyson, how the hell do you find all the time to watch everything? Yeah. It's it's hard now, man. If you remember mm-hmm. before when I started doing all this, like, it's like I didn't have a regular job. I just had that. So that was why. That was why. I'm just imagining, <laughs> do you remember the scene in Back to the Future Part 2 when when Marty McFly's son is in that room and he has the TV on and he puts on six or seven different channels at once. I'm actually picturing <laughs> you doing that very thing, watching all of these TV shows all at once. And 
then somehow being able to pick up on every single one of them. And yeah, I kind of wish like uh, I listen to like audiobooks and podcasts a lot, and, and a lot of like players for those things have options where you can like turn up the speed but keep the pitch the same, so it just sounds like you know like normal talking, but it's just sped up so that you can get through it quicker. I'm kind of like wondering when they're going to bring that to like Netflix or something. Like watch really it 120 percent speed. <laughs> I, I wouldn't really do it because it would though. ruin the pacing, but like I, I got to imagine it's 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 an eventuality when that's going to happen because people just don't have time to watch stuff and they want to get through some of it. You know, my biggest problem that was when they do it on TV show or just regular TV networks, and they will they they only speed it up maybe five six percent. It's not much, but when you are when you've watched a TV show or a movie so many times over the years, you know the cadence, you know the rhythms, you know the pitch, you know how everything flows, and then when you watch it, it just just something feels off. And speed it up for commercials. Yeah, exactly. So they can add more commercials. That's why they do that. Yeah. And I, and I hate that. I hate that with a passion. <laughs> I think it's an eventuality before it comes out. I was listening to some other podcasts and they were actually talking about how they think that we're going to start getting like cliff notes for shows. <sighs> like you'll have the show and then you could also just watch the cliff notes. So you can be kind of like part of the cultural zeitgeist without actually like investing all the time into it. <laughs> how we ruin TV. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the same way we ruin books. Yeah. <laughs> it's, the equi- almost the equivalent of watching let's plays of people playing video games rather yeah. than just playing the game. Yeah, and not even for the commentary, just straight up. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The only time I would do that would be for commentary. So yeah, uh, that's that's how you can reach us. Uh, you can also check out our site's Facebook page and our YouTube channel. That's all linked on our main site, thetotalstream.com. Uh, you can subscribe to this podcast through any major podcast client like iTunes or Podcast. And the entire backlog of our podcast is available on our YouTube channel because we can only put up like three hours at a time on uh, on SoundCloud, which is what we use as our podcast host. So beyond that, if you want to go back, if you want to listen to episode one of the podcast, that's on our YouTube channel. If you want to listen to like the last three or four episodes of the podcast, you can get all of those on um, just through your uh, your podcast client by subscribing to our RSS feed for our podcast, which is, you know, just how you subscribe to any podcast. But that's it. So thank you everybody for listening. Thank you for joining us, Nick. It was a lot of fun and we, we were so happy we were able to get somebody to, to jump in with us for our 200th episode. Absolutely. Yeah, it was, it was great. Yeah, it was really cool to have somebody for this. Uh, really awesome having you on. So, yeah. Good well, time. we'll have to have you on again when, when we're watching something that you're watching. Yeah. <laughs> Which is, that's kind of a wing and a prayer at this point. Let's know. see if Will catches up on Marvelous Miss uh, Maisel and then <laughs> right. we can bring you on for our season three discussion. <laughs> Or if you guys would just watch and watch the grand tour, even though it's not fiction, it's real, but <laughs> yeah, I, I don't, I don't know if that's going to skew for our podcast, <laughs> but, but I might or, check it out just for the elaborate stunts they do. <laughs> there's plenty of that and plenty of hilarity, but thank you everybody for listening. Good night. Good night. Lights. If you would like to reach out to us and make a comment, send an email to contact at the total screen.com. Stay tuned to the total screen for the very best 